So we're talking about burning the candle at both ends without getting burned. How do you uh, recognize the signs of burnout and foster resilience to avoid burnout in the future? And then, more importantly, get into developing a life of well-being and contentment, leading a life as an entrepreneur or a startup professional. Uh, first, I want to thank, um, quickly, here's marbles. Um, it's important that we thank all the people who make this possible. So a big thank you to Denver Startup Week and everybody who works with the organization to make this happen, and the different sponsors, from the title sponsors and the specific sponsor for this design track, also the partner sponsors and the member sponsors. If you're looking for information on any of them, you can find it on the Denver Startup Week web, uh, website. So my name is Matthew LeBauer. I'm a psychotherapist. And I work with individuals and people in relationships. That's not just people in couples, also people navigating poly and non-monogamous relationships. I work with a lot of LGBTQ people and uh, those in relationships and with people pursuing kinks and fetishes, whether that's individually or within a dyad or a group of people. And a lot of my work ends up revolving around work-life balance. How do I get everything done I want to in life when I'm struggling to make a living or make this dream come true? And what it all boils down to is once we get past all of the negative stuff and we get through the distress and manage the stressors, how do we get into developing a life of well-being? One where we experience on a sustainable, enduring basis contentment and fulfillment. I want to start with a quick video animation I made that will give you a sense in about two minutes, less than two minutes, the cycle that I run through with people and ask yourself what here feels familiar. some of that sounded familiar to some of you, I imagine. You've experienced a little bit of that at times. The first piece I want to do, if nothing else happens today and you get up and you walk out after this slide, I want you to walk out with something concrete. So right off the bat, I'm going to give you an exercise that I work on with a lot of my clients. And this is putting into your calendar or into your reminders app two recurring reminders. The first one, mine is set for Monday morning is a reminder to create two goals for the week. The first is a goal that's personal or about a relationship that I'm in, and the second one is related to work or career. If that's uh, wrap up the project this week, um, or uh, remember to take flowers home to my honey this week, whatever the two goals are, uh, you set those on Monday, and you can write them right in the notes section of that reminder or that recurring event. And then the end of the week, whether that's Friday or you want to give yourself to Sunday for the personal goal or the work goal, uh, that is the reminder to check in and follow up on how you did with those goals. And you need to wrap those goals over to the next week, and then the question becomes, what do I need to do differently to make that goal happen? Okay? So you can set those yourself and make it a practice, a habit, as a way to set the mood and get your, uh, your flow at the beginning of the week. So burnout hits all of us. And oftentimes, it becomes apparent in stark indicators. 
of overwhelming fatigue or apathy where we just stop caring about the work in front of us. It also shows up in distractibility and procrastination. I know that's a very common one. I imagine a lot of you are doing that today. Um, I certainly have been. Um, so it also then starts billowing into negativity and cynicism. Cynicism is the loss of goodwill and the um, adoption of a negative lens through which we view the world. We lose the positive outlook. Irritability and impatience is where burnout really starts erupting and taking a toll on the people around us, and they'll start speaking out. At the same time, we don't need to wait for that to happen because there are more subtle signs of burnout that we can start paying attention to and capture it. Loss of creativity, a reduction in innovation or ingenuity, pessimism, the sense that there are no good options on this project or no good ways through this task. Also noticing an increasing pattern of errors or even missed opportunities. We end up feeling rudderless, like we are without traction. And when we can start recognizing the subtle signs, then it's easier to jump in and nip it in the bud so that the burnout doesn't take a lasting toll on us. So I invite you right now on your social media uh, or with the people around you, take note of what subtle signs you've noticed in yourself of burnout creeping up. What are the red flags for you that are subtle before they become the stark costs of burnout? What kinds of things jump to your mind? Are there ideas that you've recognized, ways that you've seen burnout happening for you? I have a friend who gets really cynical. And so I've told him that he needs to exercise his cynicism to win him down a bit. So we've started to see the signs of burnout, and then it becomes essential that we short circuit them. So there are a ton of ways that we can do that. And I could sit here and give you a half hour, 40 minute presentation just on how to make that happen. But there are four here that I want to share with you because they pertain directly to the work that we are doing as startup professionals and entrepreneurs. The first is to delegate unmatched tasks. We all have things that we don't like doing because they don't attend to our interests or our passions and they don't attend to our skill set. So take those and partner with somebody else and collaborate delegating out the tasks you don't want to be doing and offer to take on the ones that attend to your passion and speak to the skill set that you have or the skills that you want to be developing. The second is to decline meetings. How many of you have just decided I'm not going to meetings anymore? Awesome. I agree with you. Meetings, nine times out of ten, are bullshit and a total waste of time. So. When I decided that I wasn't going to go to meetings anymore, I sent an email that read something like, Dear Jean, I'm not going to be in that meeting tomorrow. Um, I've reviewed the, the agenda you sent me. Thank you very much. Um, I have a sense that my time would be better spent on these things. So I'm going to spend my time doing those things, and I'll catch up on what happened in the meeting from a colleague. And I'll report back with, to you on the product of my work during that time. Let me know if you have any concerns and you wouldn't believe her response. She replied, great, thanks so much. And then I got to choose what meetings I went to because she became confident that I would be using that time more productively elsewhere if I needed to. The third piece is pairing your schedule. This is taking a really deep, hard look at where you're actually putting your time. Because the truth is, the Candy Crush and the BuzzFeed lists and the Facebook scanning are stealing more time than you would ever imagine. So at the end of the week, I encourage you to go back and fill in where you actually spent five and ten minute pockets of time. And that time can then be reallocated to, God forbid, going to bed a little bit early to catch up on sleep or getting done the things that we're putting off because those BuzzFeed puppies are just so effing cute. <laughs> I say to clients, great, you're running out of time or you don't have the time you need in the day, 
well, open up your calendar and let's take a look and go through the week and see where all your time is going. And how many clients do you think readily open their calendar and show me where all their time is going? Hasn't happened yet. <laughs> right? Because they all know that I'm going to find pockets of time that they could be using in other ways. And we end up doing that. They manage their own calendar, they take notes, fill in where their time actually goes, and we find time for them to do the things that bring them the contentment and fulfillment and fostering the resilience to burnout that they actually need in their days. And the last piece is embracing unitasking. We've all been taught that multitasking is a thing, and it's not. It just doesn't work and cognitively. We can pretend that it does. But um, a friend of mine describes multitasking as a misnomer for prioritization because we could be in a meeting and be answering emails. And the truth is, we are not doing both at the same time. We're just saying, I might be in this room, but I'm just doing my email, and that's my priority right now, and sometimes that's okay. But let's not bullshit each other that we can actually attend to, to those two uh, tasks at the same time. When you get back into unitasking, focusing on one thing at a time, the quality of the work, the creativity, the innovation goes up, the time demand goes down. So I encourage you all to go and fill in those blanks in your calendar and pair it out and find out where the space is for the things you'd actually rather be doing. So in fostering resilience to burnout, there are four categories that I want to tell you about. Practicing mindfulness, forgetting to remember, scheduling your anxiety, and scheduling your self-care. Mindfulness is about attending to now and being here. And it's about re-embodying oneself and finding presence, awareness of what's here. And it's escaping the thinky, thoughty space of all of the intrusive anxiety and stressors in our world. So the first activity um, that you can do is a brilliant one in its simplicity. And then you can do it anywhere. People won't necessarily know that you're doing it. And it only takes a few minutes. It's a body scan where you start at your toes and you work all the way up to the top of your head, tensing your muscles for a few seconds and letting go. And tensing your muscles for a few seconds and letting go. And you move up from your toes to your calves, and then your calves to your thighs, all the way up. And by the time you're done, you'll notice that your breathing has slowed and you are literally re-embodied here having escaped all of the chaos. That goes along with another one that we can all do right now, and it's called diaphragmatic breathing. Diaphragmatic breathing uh, stimulates the parasympathetic, parasympathetic nervous system and a vagal nerve response. That's the thing that happens when you see a groom fall over at the altar because he's not breathing well. When it's used well and you breathe in quickly and exhale slowly, that slows the heart rate, slows, uh, lowers the blood pressure, and lowers the cognitive load. So it's like a mini nap just from breathing. So I want to invite everybody to stand up for a quick second. And I want you to just feel both feet beneath you evenly. And I want you to lean forward a little bit so you feel the weight on your toes and bounce up and down a little bit. Feel your knees loosen. And then I want you to roll back onto your heels. Not necessarily picking your toes up off the ground, but just centering your weight over your heels. And feel that and come back to center over the arch of your foot. So that you're balanced, and you're present, and you're here. And now, with a hand on your belly, I want you to take a deep breath in, and a slow exhalation. One more in. Exhalation. One more. And you can take a seat again.
who would say that those 30 seconds shifted their sense, shifted their presence? Yeah, angry. It was also very helpful to me, so nerves. Thank you. <laughs> so another great tool that I help my clients work on is developing a two ring rule. And for some of you, this might be a one ring rule. For some of you, it might be a three ring rule. The rule is anytime a phone rings, you stop and you use the opportunity of the phone ringing to come back to center, to find a presence, take a deep breath. And just that quick moment of slowness between the rings will give your brain an opportunity to slow down. And then when you answer the phone, you're stepping forward into that call with a slower, more focused sense. And the person on the other end of the line will be more grateful about your presence there and lack of distraction than they would ever be concerned about how many rings you let go. And if we're lucky, we'll get a chance to practice that. And I encourage you to help me because it might startle me. I'm not expecting it up here. And we'll just practice taking a deep breath instead of freaking out about whose phone it is, okay? <laughs> the last, I'm really good at that. Really good at becoming uh, cynical and uh, hateful towards the people who do that in the room when I'm trying to pay attention. So it's a great opportunity for me to you know, just ease into that and not be pulled over. The last piece are ringtones and alarms. The brilliant thing about being uh, so connected and so handy with our technology is that we can record incredible sounds that, that make us uh, just full of delight. So my niece, as you can imagine, has an incredible giggle. So I recorded her giggle, and I made it my ringtone, so that when I get a phone call, it's my niece giggling instead of one of the horrific sirens or fake meditation bells uh, that Apple gives me. Uh, I've also recorded sounds of my nieces singing together. Uh, you could make a recording of you and your partner singing something together, or your children, or your nieces, your nephews, and set it to your alarm. So you're waking up to a beautiful sound instead of whatever it is you've got going on that rests you from your sleep so violently. Bless you. I also want to uh, let you all know about recurring and geolocated reminders. I mentioned the recurring reminders earlier. So here's a sample list that I've made uh, that I use. And uh, two of them are recurring and two of them are geolocated. So that uh, when my phone approaches a certain address or destination or leaves a particular address or destination, uh, I get the reminder. So for example, the first one is a mantra, celebrate strengths and bring compassion. And it's said to go off when I arrive at my office. And it's a great way to give me a trigger to shift my mindset from the chaos of traffic to uh, being present with my clients, bringing them the compassion they need to have self-compassion. And to celebrate their strengths, even in their most distressed state. Everybody has strengths that they can recognize. It just becomes hard to see them. And so I help them see them, and this serves as a reminder to do that. The second is a reminder to send a letter of love or gratitude, and that is set to repeat every week. The third is a body scan or a breathing exercise like we've just done, and that's set to remind me every day. And then the fourth is an opportunity to practice appreciation, specifically at red lights. So when I leave my office at the intersection of Colorado and Alameda, and I want to get home, I'm driving straight through Cherry Creek, and we all know the shit show that is, right? <laughs> so I can double my commute by going up Colorado, because we all want to do that. Or I can make a decision to just stick it out and drive through Cherry Creek all summer long and get a reminder that at every red light, I take a moment of appreciation. So I appreciate the people who are working so hard in the summer, summer heat, and in the dangerous uh, you know, traffic patterns to make those roads safer and more comfortable for me. I also take a moment of appreciation that I'm not that person doing that work and I'm sitting in my safe, cold car. So, 
Now we get into some real woo stuff. I want to tell you about scheduling your anxiety. I imagine all of us at one time or another have been in a meeting or been trying to focus on a particular task and these intrusive thoughts and anxieties keep poking in and distracting us, keeping us from getting done what we need to happen. When that occurs, you can just speak to your anxiety like it's an employee or a colleague knocking on your door asking if you have a quick moment and you're stuck on a phone call. And that's it. And you say, thank you so much for coming by. I don't have time for you right now. And I'm going to set aside 10 minutes for you later, and we're going to have a one-on-one. -on -one. And then those 10 minutes come, and you shut your office door, you find a quiet place, and you give a presentation. And you just give a spontaneous lecture about your anxiety. Where does your anxiety come from? When does it show up? Uh, what does it tell you about your experience? How would you like to handle your anxiety? What would life be like when it's no longer so intrusive? And also just taking a moment of gratitude for the fact that you do have a little bit of anxiety in life because it's what keeps you safe. It might be totally misguided because we're no longer being hunted by animals on the savannah, but it's still there in our brain. And so it serves a purpose. We just need to help redirect it and reorient it to where it belongs and where it doesn't. And when the first eight minutes of that presentation are up, you stop. And the next ten minute, two minutes are dedicated to shift moves. These are things that get your blood flowing, that are physically moving your body in some way. My choice are jumping jacks, um, push-ups, sometimes crunches, walking the stairs, whatever the options are that you have, even if it's just breathing for two minutes, to separate yourself and create a demarcation from the anxiety mind space, from the mindful present place, you want to launch from back into your workday. So self-care is obviously one of the most important pieces of developing resilience to burnout. Because when you invest just a little bit of time on the front end in your self-care, burnout is not going to be able to take hold. You will be resilient to it. So the first piece are naps. How many of you take naps? Oh, awesome. How many of you haven't taken a nap since you were forced to as a child? Gotcha. And a lot of us become very resistant to napping. The truth is, naps are amazing. And they don't have to be more than five minutes, and you don't even have to fall asleep. The idea that you have to sleep during a nap to make it effective is bullshit. If you just close your eyes and find a quiet place and slow down, you get the benefits of a nap. So the anxiety about, I gotta fall asleep, I've only got 10 minutes now, you can let that go because that's false. And we need to remember not to nap more than 30 minutes. Once you're napping more than 30 minutes, you're entering into a full sleep cycle and then you're gonna wake up groggier than you otherwise would. My favorite are coffee naps. Anybody try coffee naps? Brilliant. Make a cup of coffee, whatever your choice, your drink of choice is. Let it cool enough so you can drink it quickly, and you down a coffee. Then you lie down for your nap, even if it's just being mindful and quiet. And by the time you're up from your nap, after 10, 15, 20 minutes, the caffeine is starting to kick in. So you get the cognitive rejuvenation of the nap, and you get the boost from the caffeine. Sleep is another essential piece. I encourage you all to Google sleep hygiene and take a look at you know whatever the first top 10 list is that shows up on how to practice better sleep hygiene. What it boils down to is routine and no screens. Those are really the two most important pieces when it comes to the life of an entrepreneur or a professional. Because screens hinder the release of melatonin. Melatonin is what makes us sleepy and helps us fall into sleep. So it's essential that you learn to put the screen down at least 60 minutes before you want to be asleep. Your sleep is not going to improve until that starts happening. And I can tell you because my sleep hasn't yet start, started to improve. <laughs> I get stuck in that. And as somebody with insomnia, I then go and pick up my bright screen and it just wakes me up even more. 
Also, we think that sometimes we can just, when we finally get a day off, catch up on sleep. And that's another myth. We don't really catch up on sleep until we're going to sleep early. So it's essential that you push things off or get things done early or however you can make it happen, but be in bed by 9 or 10 p.m. instead of midnight, 1 or 2. Because sleeping in or waiting till the weekend to catch up isn't going to cut it. Flow is another essential aspect of self-care. This is where the saying, time flies when you're having fun, comes from. Most of us find flow in exercise or hobbies, uh, whether it's ceramics or crochet uh, or cycling. And the more you get it in, even in short snippets, the better off you will be. So you might identify your flow as something like being in the gym or being out in nature. How many would say that's where they find flow? Okay, excellent. And how many people can find flow in just five or ten minutes? Awesome. Nice, about five or six of this crowd. We all need to find ways to incorporate flow, to get into flow in just five or ten minutes because we're not going to be able to get out into nature or into the gym enough to get the kind of flow we need to build resilience to burn out. And the last piece related to that is exercise. We probably all exercise a little bit in Colorado and we all need to exercise a little bit more. When we exercise in the morning, it's more beneficial than in the afternoon or the evening because it sets the pace of the day, it boosts your mood, it raises your metabolism, and increases your energy to move forward instead of getting to an afternoon opportunity to work out or exercise however you define that and not having the energy to really do it full force. One of the interesting facts is uh, testosterone is at its highest in the morning. And testosterone is one of the hormones that helps us really push hard in a workout or an exercise. And so use the testosterone that you have, both men and women, and everybody in between, uh, have testosterone. It peaks in the morning. So use it to get in that exercise. And research from just a few weeks ago indicates that only five minutes of exercise that helps you lose your breath has enduring psychological and physical benefits. That's like walking up and down the stairs to use the bathroom at work, okay? Five minutes is really easy. So moving out of burnout and into what it means to be a happy preneur, what does it mean to take on the commitment of fostering a life of well-being? Happiness, for our purposes, is synonymous enough with well-being, fulfillment, and contentment. You've heard me use them interchangeably. Bless you. Um, one of the greatest parts about being human is that we get the prefrontal cortex. It's one of the newest parts of the brain. It's what gives us the opportunity to navigate social nuance, to make judgments and decisions, uh, and as Dan Gilbert describes, it's an experience simulator. It's what gives us the opportunity to remember and rehash experiences we have and anticipate experiences we will have. It's the thing that gives us the real in our brain so that we can create happiness from that experience. We can have natural happiness that's born of experiences that we have already lived and synthetic happiness born of recalling experiences we've had and positively anticipating future ones. So we get as much joy and positive impact from anticipating vacations we're going to take as we do actually experiencing those vacations. And his research indicates that there's no qualitative difference between synthetic happiness using our imagination from natural happiness born of our lived experiences. So when I work with clients on this couch, there are five themes for well-being that I help them work through. Developing PERMA, developing a practice of gratitude that I mentioned earlier, embracing uncertainty, mastering enoughism, and targeting your love. PERMA is an acronym that comes from the research of Martin Seligman, one of the founders of positive psychology. 
This stands for positive emotions, engagement, positive relationships, meaning, and achievement. And I help clients integrate each of these as much as possible on a recurring basis into their lives. So positive emotions. Those are the things we get, the good feelings that flood us when we finish a project, when we sign a contract, when we get good nookie, on and on. And we need to find ways to replicate that, those sensations in our lives in appropriate ways. The, the next piece is engagement, and that's the flow that I was talking about. How do we find nuggets of time and ways to get into flow in just five or 10 minutes throughout the workday? Positive relationships. This is identifying the positive relationships that are existent and bolstering them. This is finding the relationships that are in existence already and have the potential to be more positive. How do we turn them to be more positive? These are the colleagues uh, that you might see around but don't really engage with. How do you find ways to engage with them directly in a positive way that leaves you both smiling as you walk away? My favorite opportunity for in that category of positive relationships are people in, uh, in the service industry. So the people on the other side of the register for me or the people who are helping me out at a restaurant. I make sure that I take time to greet them and say hello and how was your day and learn their name often so that we have a positive connection and they see my smile before I start asking them to do stuff for me. And that, in just this tiny little nugget, counts as a positive relationship that boosts my well-being, and hopefully theirs. Meaning is purpose in life. How do we serve a purpose higher than ourselves? Most people do this through donating money, donating time, volunteering, mentoring, etc. And achievement. These are the goals that we set that are difficult but attainable. How do we set appropriate ones? go and make them happen, and then review the experience to capture all of the goodness and build some synthetic happiness out of that. Gratitude and appreciation. I've talked about this a bit. And so I encourage you to think through how many different service workers do you encounter in a day? And how can you take a quick moment to make that into a positive touch point? Just a little bit of connection with them as a way to bring well-being and contentment into your life and into theirs. For me, engineering is a great place to have appreciation. Because when I enter a situation with a lack of engineering, like my air conditioner goes off, I notice that shit. So it allows me to then have appreciation for when it is working. Even the hinge on the door of my car. Like that's something I can take a quick moment of appreciation for because it serves me, it helps me, and that door keeps me safe. Gung ho. That's a little taste of appreciation in my day to help build a practice of gratitude. The important thing is that it becomes a daily practice. And as you can see, it can be random. It doesn't really matter. Uh, I had tea this morning with a friend. Uh, in a coffee house, and oftentimes the music playing in coffee houses is just totally distracting to me. So I was having a hard time focusing on the conversation. I took a moment to distract myself from the invasive music and found a moment to appreciate the tea sediment. I couldn't have really pissed that the teapot was allowing the sediment through and it was in my cup and bleh. But I noticed that it wasn't. It wasn't getting into my mouth. So I took a moment of appreciation that physics allows that tea sediment to stay in the bottom of the cup and not get all nasty in my mouth. <laughs> Yay for that. In Judaism, there are these two great blessings about gratitude. One is kind of meta. It's called the Shehekianu. And it's the idea that when we reach this particular moment, we can have gratitude or when we've come this far, when we're with this special group of people, we can say it as a way to recognize this holy moment. There's also a brilliant one, if you work in a summer camp like I did, to help young adolescent boys learn gratitude. There's a blessing that you can say in the morning that thanks the divine for the opportunity to have this body with vessels that pump and holes that open and release. And what adolescent boy doesn't want to thank God for a good morning poop? 
tell you it's a great way to get them into a practice of gratitude. And the last piece is discovering beauty. It's all around us. It's everywhere. And when we take a quick moment to recognize whether it's in design or whether it's in nature, just noticing something that is beautiful to you is enough to instill in you a sense of fulfillment and well-being. So I want to show you something else that I'm grateful for. It's part of my practice of gratitude in loving art. And as I showed to you and tell you about it, I encourage you to tweet out or text to somebody you love a quick moment of gratitude or appreciation for them or for your experience today. So this is a piece of artwork by a friend of mine, Chris Cosett. You can see it's a fish in beautiful water and possibly some coral behind it. I love this because I love my friend and I think she's an amazing artist. And it reminds me of scuba diving in Bonaire and that's just one of the most meditative experiences for me. So when I look at this, I go back there immediately and feel calmer. So we've all been taught to have the right answers, right? We get recognized and validated when we know the answer to the math problem or remember the definition of the word or the capital of the state, right? How many people have had that experience? Uh-huh. Oh, you're not certain about that? No? <laughs> I am. I'm pretty confident that all of us have been called to question to know an exact answer at some point or another. And the problem is, that is a fallacy. Because when we commit to having all the answers and being certain, we just get limited and we lose opportunity. On the other side, when we embrace uncertainty and let go of the need to know the next steps of the project or the next goal or how to handle a problem that comes up, we forego the fallacy and the limitations of certainty. We open to the possibilities and the opportunities that arise when we allow ourselves to wonder when we get back to being curious about the possibilities, then our work becomes more creative and more innovative and more productive. Most importantly, as a concrete rule to avoid a world of certainty and embrace uncertainty, is eliminating the word but from your vocabulary. But only invalidates what comes before it. So whether it's with your honey at home, or chatting with your kids, or disciplining your kids, or navigating and collaborating in the workplace. Whenever you hear the word but, a red flag should go up. And you say, what, oh my gosh, I'm sorry. I want to pause that, redact that little piece, and rewrite it. Because whatever you said that's but just eliminates the meaning and the utility of everything before it and invalidates what your interlocutor has just said to you. So you replace it with, yes and. Because there's always a nugget of truth, even if it's only the opinion or the perception of the person you're talking to, there's always a nugget of truth in what they're saying, and you can validate that. Yes, you can have that crazy idea, and I see that a little bit differently. So that you get in the conflicting idea or you build on and add to in the conversation without having to invalidate what it is they had said before. Related to letting go of certainty is letting go of perfection. I imagine there are a couple of perfectionists in this crew. Let me see who you are. Hallelujah. Uh-huh. And those other slow hands, I know you too. That's okay. I'm here with you. When we can let go of perfection, life takes off. Because when we're all subject to the societal and cultural training that we need to be perfect or at least strive for perfection, it's just feigning infallibility. And the people around us see that as fake. And when the people around us see us trying to be perfect or pretending to be perfect, it's triggering because they get nervous that we're going to expect them to be perfect. And they get nervous and realize that, oh my God, I'm not perfect. I can't live up to that standard. And so they get really nervous and they back off. It's totally off-putting to people. And that hinders our capacity to create connection that gives us the collaboration and the innovation and creation 
uh, creativity we need. As opposed to when we can just be ballsy enough to say, I'm enough. The quality of this work is enough. So I can just give it a signature, the stamp of approval, and be on my way, knowing that nobody actually expects it to be perfect. And that's fine. And when we say that and allow ourselves to be vulnerable in that imperfection, the people around us take a deep sigh. Because now they're not expected to be perfect either. They can be vulnerable with us, recognizing that we're all going to screw up at one time or another. And because we're working together and have good connection, we'll be able to pick up the pieces and move on, and that product will eventually get better than it would have otherwise been. The vulnerability makes us approachable, and in that approachability, we get the authentic connection with our colleagues and our loved ones. The last piece I want to tell you about is targeting your love. There's a great book called The Five Love Languages, and it's a little bit of pop psychology. It's really accessible, short read, makes a huge difference. Basically, it says that we all talk our love in different ways. We show our love in different ways, and we're usually showing love in the way we most readily take in, accept, and feel loved. So the author mentions things like quality time, acts of service, like doing dishes, um, uh, taking out the trash, managing bedtime for the kids, um, gifts, thank you, and there's one more. Physical oh. touch. Physical touch, there you go. Awesome. And that book is really great, and at the same time it doesn't quite cut it when you are working 24-7 and don't have the opportunity to get home and learn a new language with your partner and discover their love language and help discover your own. So, as entrepreneurs and startup professionals, we can see this as an opportunity to put a product out there, our love, into this marketplace, the relationship, for the consumer, our loved one, and foster the development of that love in the way that that consumer is going to take in our love as a product and use it and feel it and blossom the relationship. And at the risk of sounding like I'm commodifying love, and there is that risk, and we have to be mindful of it and careful not to, it's also a brilliant way to deconstruct the idea and set it forth with our partner so that we can give them the product that they're looking for. We have so little time and energy in the work that we're doing to just separate from it and be present with them. We need to make sure we're getting the most out of every minute with them. And so we can ask questions of them, like, when do you feel most loved by me? What is it that I do that helps you feel most cherished? And how can I foster our connection? Those questions can start just a brief conversation, and they can start a really long conversation when you have time, and this needs to become a recurring conversation in your relationships, and not just with your loved ones, but also with other people in your life. Outside the context of love, this is also great for friendships, and great for parent-child relationships. So, I encourage you to practice this and ask these questions of yourself. When do you feel most loved by your partner? What is it that your partner is doing that helps you feel most cherished? And how is your partner fostering the connection between the two of you? Or the three of you, or four of you, or however many are in your relationship? Because those questions will teach you about your love language and how you take in love from them so that you can feel most cherished and loved in the limited time you have with them and it sets the model and leads into the conversation so you can make sure that you're showing love in the way your partner can take it in and feel it and have, even if in just a few minutes a day of connection, feel the love. 
So just to recap, we've talked about the stark and the subtle signs of burnout and how to pick them up, how to foster resilience to the burnout. We've talked about developing happiness and, and the prefrontal cortex that allows us to create synthetic happiness in addition to the natural happiness we get from our experiences in life. We've talked about PERMA, the five attributes of people living with well-being. Practicing gratitude, letting go of certainty and embracing uncertainty, mastering enoughism, and how you can target your love. Uh, as I mentioned before, I'm going to post this on my website so you can uh, have full access to it. And then each of the resources and references is a hyperlink It'll take you straight to whether it's a TED Talk, um, the link to five love languages, Mayu Sanctuary, this takes you to a PDF that's an intro to mindfulness and meditation. Um, and on the bottom left it says TED Happiness, that's one of their curated playlists of TED Talks around fostering happiness and well-being. I'm happy to answer questions right now, and I'm also thrilled to take questions after uh, this presentation. Feel free to email, call, however you'd like to reach me. Feel free to come into my office. You're always welcome. It's a safe, warm, comfortable environment. And I'd be delighted to come and speak in your workplace uh, if you think that your workplace could benefit from some of this information. Thank you all so much for the opportunity to speak with you. Um, I'd love to take some questions to dig deeper into what I've said. Appreciate it. Yes. So you mentioned flow earlier, and I was wondering what you think are or what have you come across as some like activities that we can do as individuals to kind of catalyze flow when we're feeling flat over Excellent. So the question was, what are some other ideas of flow that we can uh, incorporate? So one of the most common and readily accessible is reading. And uh, flow is best achieved in reading fiction. Uh, fantasy, if you're into it. Nonfiction uses a different part of the brain. Uh, and we're also not talking about uh, BuzzFeed or Facebook. Um, or video games. Those are great and they're distracting and it's really nice, but they are numbing as opposed to enriching. And so we need to find the opportunities and the options that are enriching and not just distractions. So another great one is short periods of exercise. What are there other ideas that have gone through your mind? Yeah, one of the things that uh, just encouraged me is in, in, in the situation as an entrepreneur you're often walking into situations where you're wanting to put your best foot forward. And one of the things that uh, you can look up Dr. Ann Cuddy as a TED Talk and uh, did, does this awesome study about you know the champion, the posturing. So you could probably just go ahead and explain that. But the idea that you can raise your testosterone by 20% and dropping your uh, cortisol by about an equal number uh, within 60 seconds is amazing. Absolutely. Thank That's you. a great reminder. Thank you. And I should have had her uh, link up on my resources. Well, you can share that. You know. Right. So, um, so Anne Cuddy uh, has this great TED Talk that's worth looking into, and her research shows that just by posturing before walking into an unknown environment, like a meeting, uh, you can boost your testosterone, shift your mindset to confidence, and lower your cortisol. That's the hormone that uh, causes you um, stress that makes you feel the stress and fatigue. And so lowering that while boosting your testosterone, you walk in there with a sense of control and confidence. And it's just in several postures. It's things like the Superman pose, right? Legs out about uh, shoulder length with your hands on your hips and looking into a mirror if you have it uh, in front of you. Other ones um, are like a large X, arms out, um, taking up space is the key there, as opposed to hunkering down and running away. Okay? And so that also comes across in when you're sitting in a meeting. The more space you take up and the more you're leaning in, the more confident you will be. Not only the more confident you will look, but the more confident you will feel. And so avoiding crossing your legs, crossing your arms. 
arms, keeping your chin up, um, and leaning on the table are all techniques that she goes into. Thanks so much for reminding me about that. Um, I know it's a technique of a form of exercise, but martial arts are actually a really great club as well. Absolutely. Martial arts is an incredible way, and there's a, a, a tremendous variety of martial arts that you can, um, that you can get into. One of my favorite uh, is Aikido, because it's about defensive posturing and energy flow. It's about matching the energy that's coming at you and managing it in a way to keep it from hurting you, as opposed to countering it, which just creates conflict. It's using the energy of the other person, the partner or the assailant. Awesome, thanks. Skiing. Skiing is great, absolutely. Talk about the wind in your hair, fresh air, it's awesome. So I think that at a, at a basic level, we all agree that things like exercise help our general happiness, but it's oftentimes when you're stressed out, tough to honor that time and honor that commitment to actually go do exercise. So I was wondering if you could speak to um, quantifying happiness and tracking and, and any tools or uh, techniques that you could use to easily be able to look back and, and sort of bolster your own brain's knowledge and say, yeah, like, I do know that exercise helps and I'm actually going to take time to do it instead of just continuing to work for email or to work for whatever else. My first response is about the idea of keeping track of data and um, how we quantify things. So I put a lot of effort into quantifying my referrals the first few years that I was in business and knowing um, when in the month they came in, uh, what the seasonality told me about them, who they were coming from, uh, what the profession of the referral source was, um, as a way to boost my confidence in my uh, caseload and boost my confidence in the work that I was doing, how was my referral source uh, spreading. And what I realized was I already know all the information I need to know about my referral sources. I've got them. They treat me really well. They appreciate my gratitude and they end up sending me more clients. I don't need to keep more data than that. So when we talk about monitoring our happiness and quantifying it, it's important that we not get bogged down in data about our happiness and lose the opportunity to experience our happiness, to feel our happiness and revel in it. Just because we want to see where it is on the graph. I think that is important, no doubt. And at the same time, we have to be careful we don't take it too far and lose the time to track it. Is that helpful? And also, I would say that the issue isn't the ringtone. 
it's the piece that makes moving any sound at that time of day problematic because it's not the song, obviously. So let's look at what the real issue is, uh, lack of sleep or fatigue or apathy or burnout that turns that moment and that trigger into something really toxic. There were some questions in the back I want to make sure I get to. Yeah. I was just going to ask, when we talk about scheduling different things, I was kind of wondering where you come up, where you come to a balance between schedule and, and just having the free flow of your day in general and time and, and enjoyment in that. Excellent. That kind of goes back to the quantifying piece of let's not get bogged down in making sure that every minute of the day is structured and scheduled. And I think that's really important. That's where there's an important balance between goals and tasks for the day and making things scheduled so that you can knock out one thing that you're dreading early on and save for later something that you're looking forward to doing or you know will be energizing. Um, and uh, also having flexibility so that even if you've scheduled something to be done at a particular time, it gets moved around. My schedule, I have eight different calendars in my iCal, and every day is overlapping different colors, but that doesn't mean that I'm doing all of those different things at those different times. Some of them just tell me uh, when my partner's at work or not, and some of them are concrete tasks I've blocked out time for because I know that's something I have to get done today. And it often gets shifted to later on if I end up staying an extra half hour in, in consultation with peers. Does that make sense? Yeah. Does that help me answer the question? So, I mean, just picking up what you just asked on, that's that aspect of creating margin. I mean, is that also just that practical part about when you manage your calendar, making sure you're leaving margin between things? You have a chance to breathe and... That is absolutely the truth. That there is seldom that you should have one concrete task or event or meeting right up next to another, even if you've blocked in time for the commute. So I put in my commutes, and every commute I count is 30 minutes. So I leave 30 minutes before something is to start, and it rarely takes that long to get there in my Hugo Mundo of Capitol Hill, Cherry Creek. Um, and so I end up with a built-in five or 10 minutes to catch up with something, uh, return a phone call, take a few minutes to breathe or walk around. Yeah, it's important to build in the margins so you have some downtime not to limit the chaos and to give you a break between obligations. Other questions? Yes? I just wanted to thank you for putting out that amazing difference between saying but and yes and. Yeah. I've been studying improvisational theater for more than 10 years. And those were yes and the foundation for improv. And I found that the richest moments I've had in improv have been in real life and have nothing to do with That's being right. funny or on stage or acting or comedy. That's right. Absolutely. I learned it from studying improv. And I came back uh, when I was studying communication skills and conflict resolution. And uh, you know, on stage, when you say but, you start your sentence with but in response to somebody. It shrinks the world to so few options. Where do you go from there? As opposed to yes and no. We've got you new know, and butterflies and you find some of the stage. And in and in relationships, I encourage you all the next time you're in some difficult conversation with somebody and you hear yourself say the word but, 